Ladies and gentlemen, we are about to start. Can you hear me? Okay, just turn it on. That's all you have to do. <laughs> okay, so we're about to start. Um, Sir Kenneth Hall, former Governor General of Jamaica and former principal of the Mona campus. Um, Ambassador Sue Cobb, in whose name this lecture is being delivered, and her family. Mr. Spall Sully, who is the country director for the Jamaica Peace Corps, U.S. Embassy. Professor, the Honorable Ambassador Richard Burnham, who you will hear from later. And we also have a representative of the the Cuban Embassy, uh, Mr. Ricardo Calvo, and the Ambassador of the Mexican Embassy, Ambassador Juan Gonzalez. Other members of the Diplomatic Corps, staff, all distinguished staff, students of the University of the West Indies, our guests, our visitors, and I've left out one important person, very critical to this event, Mr. Ms. Uh, Wendy Hart, who's president of the American Friends of Jamaica, who is one of the, the organizing groups, co-organizers of this event. We have many guests from outside of the university and other institutions, UTEC, etc. Other distinguished ladies and gentlemen, welcome to the annual research week as we have come to associate this lecture with, the annual Sue uh, Cobb family lecture, and today to be delivered by Ambassador Richard Burnham. Today, we will be treated to an excursion into the intricacies of the relationship between Jamaica and China, and we will hear from a distinguished son of the soil, Ambassador Richard Burnham. But before we do that, I'm going to call on Mr. Paul Sully, who's the country director for the Peace Corps, to come and say a few words, greet you, and say a few things about this lecture. Over to you. Good afternoon, or good evening. I'm not sure where we're at. Honorable ambassadors, Wendy Hart, professors, students, distinguished guests. My name is Paul Sully, as has been stated. I'm the country director for Peace Corps Jamaica, an agency of the US government. And I bring you greetings from Charge Eric Kant. Those of you who know him will see him arrive a little bit later, but he wanted to make sure that the greetings from the U.S. government was well represented, and I offered the challenge. And as I said earlier, in the, I'm in the volunteer business, and I miss the volunteering, so here I am. But it is my distinct pleasure, really. I want to commend the University of the West Indies for hosting this lecture series. Uh, the words lecture and university seem to be uh, a natural fit. I also commend the U.S. Exchanges Alumni Association for its co-sponsorship of this lecture. 
I'm very pleased there is a U.S. Exchanges Alumni Association in Jamaica. In my experience, those who share a unique travel and learning experience have a special bond. I commend the American Friends of Jamaica for its co-sponsorship of this lecture. I have a good friend who was a senior government official in African country where I worked. He said he liked friends groups. He said we can pay lobbyists to represent us, but when the account ends, the lobbying goes away. Friends groups have that other commitment and passion built in part by personal relationships. Friends groups represent us too. There is no payment account, there's no termination of the relationship when the money stops. They are helpful as a friend would be. The relationship endures as a friendship is meant to be. Those are the words he told me this many years ago and I've stayed with us. And I'm a member of a number of friends groups, I should add. I want to acknowledge the Cobb family for supporting this lecture series. Sue Cobb, who I didn't realize I'd be sitting next to, uh, many of you know, was the U.S. Ambassador to Jamaica from 2001 to 2005. And uh, in this role, she was the first female ambassador from the U.S. to Jamaica. A lawyer by education, she has a long history of public service as well as private sector pursuits. I did a little bit of reading today and yesterday. This woman is a woman of action. She was the first woman from the U.S. to attempt to summit Mount Everest and she wrote a book about it. And I was so pleased to see her because she's about my eye level. <laughs> and I think this, the podium may hide this, but I'm not a very tall person here, so. Her husband, Charles Cobb, is a successful businessman. His public career included time as an ambassador to Iceland, and I should say before his wife took up residence here, and I think they might have learned something about living in cold climates. And then I learned a little bit more. He came here, you know, off and on over the her period of being here. But I tell you, you know, this is an association that's very distinguished for a number of reasons. After reading their impressive resumes, and I'm not here certainly to introduce her, but I wanted to know what I was getting into. Who is this Cobb family? And uh, after I read their resumes and their listings, I said, uh, if you ever wanted an example of world citizenship or a power couple, I recommend you Google their names and have a read. Have a read yourself. It's, uh, it's an amazing array of stories of the, their successes and achievements in the private sector and civic action and philanthropy. And those of you who have known her for many years, I think you'll know what I'm talking about probably better than I. That's just reading about them. So it's an honor for me to sit next to and be part of this lecture. I'm not, I'm not going to capture any bio, biological, uh, biographical notes, nor biological for that matter, <laughs> biographical notes of our speaker because I'm thankfully somebody else is going to be making that introduction. But I want to leave on one final uh, note here. I want to make a statement about Peace Corps and the Peace Corps connection to this event and its supporters. The Peace Corps mission is world peace and friendship. Nearly 4,000 volunteers have served here in Jamaica since June 1962. Those are people who have lived and worked alongside Jamaicans. They are your friends as well. I want to extend my greetings once again on behalf of the U.S. government. Thank you so much. Thank you. And um, for those of you who may not know much about the Sue Cobb, the Cobb Family Lecture Series, let me give you a very brief um, background. It was started in 2006 um, by the then uh, U.S. Ambassador, as you heard, um, to Jamaica, uh, Sue Cobb, and uh, was funded with an endowment from the Cobb Foundation. The organization the, the lecture series is intended to provide a public forum for discussion on issues that affect the future of Jamaica, 
The series has been designed to not only raise awareness surrounding the pressing issues facing Jamaica, Jamaican development, but also provide an arena of discussion and debate. We are all concerned with Jamaica's future, may listen to expert and academic findings such as um, today, uh, as well as to make their own voices heard. The lecture is scheduled to coincide with the principal's research day activities and um, aims to give researchers a podium to express their views to the public. Now, over the years, we've had a number of lectures. I'm not going to go through all of them, but I will highlight some of them. Well, they're, well, 2006, so I think it might be good to hear about some of them. And the first one, of course, was delivered by Ambassador Cobb. Uh, it was entitled Reflections as Ambassador and Envisioning Jamaica's Future. We also had one focusing on crime by Dr. Derek Goodlandes. Professor Stephen Vassiani delivered one in 2008 on human rights. Dr. Herbert Gale um, spoke about, uh, delivered a lecture on the murder rate, solution for reducing the murder rate. Uh, in 2010, Dr. Claudia Crawford Brown delivered a lecture on understanding the development of criminal behavior of children. And Dr. Paris Louis Ayi uh, delivered one which focused on innovative technology and innovative thinking. Um, Professor Weber, our current principal, he delivered one on funding environmental research at the UWI. And Ms. Claudia Gordon, out of many one people, was the title of her presentation. Professor Byron Wilson looked at um, imminent extinction in the land of wood and water. Can they be averted? Professor Michael Taylor, the climate change expert, he focused on a lecture entitled Two Degrees, Too Much, Too Little, Too Late, is the question. And uh, Ambassador Alun Ndombe Asamba delivered a lecture on education, education and healthcare, the equitable imperative for Jamaica. And then in 2018, last year, Professor Archibald MacDonald, our, um, last, our previous principal, he delivered a lecture on The Journey Continues. And so today, we have uh, Professor, the Honorable Ambassador Richard Burner, who will deliver a lecture entitled The China Jamaica, Jamaica Capital Connection. And um, as you, those of you who might know Richard Burner, he doesn't like long introductions. He's indicated that I should keep everything brief. But Richard, I'm sorry, I'm going to <laughs> defy you today. Um, because you're such an, a distinguished person, I think we need to know all about you. And to be honest with you, there's a lot, but I've managed to sort of um, condense it into one page, but I'm not going to read you the one page because we want to hear more about his lecture. But Ambassador Richard Burnell was educated at the University of the West Indies, the University of Pennsylvania, the New School for Social Research, and the School for Advanced International Studies of the Johns Hopkins University. He holds the degrees of BSc, MA, and PhD in Economics, and uh, Masters in Public policy. He's a member of the board of directors of the Inter-American Development Bank. Uh, he was from 2008 to 2016. And previously, uh, previous to that, he was a chief trade negotiator for the Caribbean community. Uh, as the director general of the Caribbean Regional Negotiating Machinery for four years, he had responsibility for trade negotiations for CARICOM, Cuba, and the Dominican Republic. He was principal negotiator for a forum of the Caribbean states, CARI Forum. In, in the negotiation of the CARICOM European Union Economic Partnership Agreement, and CARICOM's lead negotiator and spokesperson in the World Trade Organization and the free trade area of the Americans. So he has a lot of experience in trade and trade negotiations. Now, he was also Jamaica's ambassador to the United States and permanent representative to the Organization of American States um, between 1991 to August 2001. When he demitted office 10 and a half years later, he was the fourth most senior ambassador in Washington, D.C. and dean of the Caribbean Diplomatic Corps. Ambassador Bernal has given testimony to several committees of Congress, that's the House and Senate, and the U.S. International Trade Commission on issues of concern to the Caribbean. For seven years, he taught international economics and developed economics at the University of the West Indies. He's published over 100 articles in, in scholarly books, journals, monographs, etc. He has, um, he has a study looking at uh, car reform in the EU and the EU partnership agreement. And um, his, one of his most recent books, Dragon in the Caribbean, China's Global Repositioning, 
challenges and opportunities for the Caribbean. I, so I have a copy of it, and I have read part of it, Richard. It's a very good book, so I'm going to do a little advertising and marketing. It's a good book. I, I would ask you to get a copy. You can get one from the University Press or from Amazon. A very good book, I'm telling you. Um, the Influence of States on Superpowers, Jamaican um, U.S. Foreign Policy, which was published by the University of the West Indies Press. He's appeared on McNeil Lear, C CNN, PBS, BBC, and he's quoted extensively in the Financial Times, Washington, New York Times, Washington Times. He's quoted by all the American media, almost all of them, it seems. He's written editorials in Washington Post, Wall Street Journal, Miami Herald, and Washington and the Washington Times. So what more can I say? A man who is eminently qualified to speak on this topic that is of interest to us, I now introduce you, Ambassador the Honorable Professor Richard Burnham. Master of Ceremonies, Deputy Principal of the Mona Campus, Professor Ian Boxill. Thank you for saving me the embarrassment of advertising my own book. I'm sure your endorsement is going to create a jump in sales. I'd like to acknowledge Sir Kenneth Hall, former Governor General and former Principal of the Mona Campus. Ambassador Sue Cobb, who did such an excellent job here, and who is still on the job working for Jamaica. Wendy Hart of the American Friends of Jamaica, we know how much that organization does for Jamaica, particularly for children, and we appreciate that. I feel very privileged today that so many of my colleagues have made time to come and support me, or maybe it is a sign that I do need their support, but <laughs> let me acknowledge my friends and colleagues. Um, Professor Griffith, Professors Don. It's quite a thing when there are two professors in the same family. Three. Three, okay. <laughs> uh, Professor Vereen Shepherd, Professor um, Davidson, who just came in. I'd like to recognize Miss Mina Israel, special advisor to the Vice Chancellor, who is the impresario of fundraising for the university. I'd like to rec recognize members of the diplomatic corps, the ambassador of Mexico, representatives from the embassy of Cuba, and from the EU commission. I have two special members of the diplomatic corps that I would like to mention. They are former Jamaican ambassadors to China. We have ambassador Thomas, uh, also a former ambassador to the United States, and Ambassador Pickersgill is somewhere here. We're very pleased that you have come to keep watch on me, as what I say about Professor Tennant, uh, and forgive me if I fail to mention any other. Professor Biwaji is here, yes. So let me thank all of you for coming, ladies and gentlemen, students, friends, colleagues. Today, I'm going to speak about and invite you to discuss with me the topic of China-Jamaica capital connection. I've chosen that topic because it's one that has aroused some controversy in Jamaica recently. For example, the People's National Party spokesman on national security spoke of a new economic colonialism being imposed by China and Jamaica. And the Minister of Finance, Dr. Nigel Clark, dismissed this as xenophobia, and the Prime Minister described it as fear-mongering. 
But it's widespread. I was driving home listening to the radio and there was a gentleman exhorting us. Exhorting us to be more spiritual. And he suddenly launched into a tirade about Chinese taking over the country. So I think it's controversial. Let me begin by saying that we need to look at this by looking at the issues which have been raised about the Chinese-Jamaican connection. And I isolate six of them because what I want to do is to do an evaluation of the merits and the merits of this as a kind of balanced scorecard. First of all, there is the issue of the loss of economic sovereignty, which is supposed to arise from the fact that there is Chinese foreign direct investment in Jamaica. Secondly, there is the allegation that having borrowed development assistance loans from China, that successive governments are vulnerable to, if not having had the influence of China exerted on them. Thirdly, there is the ongoing complaint of the displacement of Jamaican workers. The argument is that Chinese construction firms are using an unnecessary amount of Chinese workers and taking jobs from Jamaica. Fourthly, the displacement of Jamaican businesses. It is often said that Chinese businesses are displacing local businesses because they have the advantage of Mandarin and of connections in Hong Kong and China. Five, there are complaints about the quality of construction work carried out by Chinese firms. And six, there is the allegation that Chinese firms are insensitive to the natural environment and liable to create severe damage whenever they execute products. So let me begin by saying that investment is critical for economic growth and it can come in the form of domestic investment or foreign capital. And foreign capital can be either loans or investment. Jamaica throughout its history as a developing country has always sought to raise the level of investment by both taking development assistance loans and encouraging foreign direct investment. Jamaica's need for investment is evident if you look at the rate of growth of the economy over the last 30 or 40 years it has been low and the rate of growth of per capita income has also been similarly low. This was compounded after the 2008 global financial crisis, which coincided with the loss of preferential trade arrangements and a reduction in development aid from traditional sources. So as Jamaica entered the last 10, 15 years, it was in particular need of investment, and it was um, interested in having foreign capital come in to raise that level. Now, turning to China as a source of capital. First of all, China is now one of, if not the largest source of development aid going to developing countries. Secondly, China is now the second largest source of foreign direct investment throughout the world, second only to the United States. Now the prerequisites of capital from China are the following. One, practicing the one China policy. That is particularly important to China because there are still countries that recognize Taiwan as the government of China. This is something the People's Republic of China finds particularly irksome. And uh, there are areas mainly involving small developing economies in the Pacific, the Caribbean, and Central America where there is competition for diplomatic recognition between Taiwan and China. So China is very um, appreciative of countries that practice the one China policy. Secondly, 
Jamaica for almost half a century, that is since 1972, has practiced without any deviations the one China policy. And therefore, China looked at Jamaica as an area that they were comfortable with the solidarity and one in which they were prepared to provide aid and to allow foreign investment. Thirdly, China's development lending. Like every developed country that provides aid, China has not only altruistic and human, humanitarian motives, but they have real political and economic motives. We don't want to shy away from that as we evaluate the role of Chinese capital. First of all, as I mentioned, on the diplomatic political front, there is the issue with Taiwan. But secondly, on the economic front, China uses aid, like all other countries, to promote exports, to win friends and influence governments, and to provide outlets for employment and investment for their firms. This is called tied aid, and nearly 70% of all development assistance is tied. I mention that because one of the complaints is that when you get a loan from China, you have to hire a Chinese firm, to buy Chinese equipment. This is nothing unusual, it's the norm. Fourthly, China has since 2003 liberalized the permissions that are normally required to allow firms to invest abroad and have, has been actively promoting greater engagement in the global economy through encouraging its firms to invest abroad. The reasons that these firms would invest abroad fall into search for raw materials, particularly energy, looking for markets, either large domestic markets or export platforms, seeking assets and seeking um, efficiency. I pause to recognize former Prime Minister Bruce Golding. And now, we're the question of the receptivity of Jamaica to Chinese capital. Jamaica is very receptive to Chinese capital. This is not surprising. Jamaica has been borrowing development assistance loans since it became independent in 1962. Admittedly, those were either from Western bilateral sources, the US, Canada, UK, EU, or from multilateral development financing institutions like the World Bank and IDB. More recently, as China became a source of development capital, and as Western sources became more difficult to access because Jamaica was a middle-income country, middle-income developing country, the, the um, receptivity to Chinese loans increased. In addition, Jamaica has always had a tradition of welcoming foreign direct investment. And I want to make the, the point in passing that much of Chinese foreign direct investment is from private Chinese firms. And they're no different from any other firm. They look for advantages. They're tough negotiators and so on. However, one difference is that some of these investments are made by state enterprises and that brings into play a much higher degree of government involvement on both sides. Now, we have been hearing a lot of talk about the amount of Chinese capital. Let us turn now to the question of the stock of um, development loans and then the stock of foreign direct investment. As of now, the total outstanding debt of China, to, of Jamaica to China, is 626 million US dollars. This is approximately 4.1% of Jamaica's total export, external debt. The loans from China are usually through the Chinese Development Bank or the Chinese, Chinese Import-Export Bank. And the, the terms are usually 2 to 3%. 
for the term. One of the attractions is that it often comes with less conditionality than some of the bilateral sources, which um, come along with not only economic conditionality, but sometimes conditionality that countries find intrusive on their social and political system. So it's not the huge amount of debt, nor is it such a large share of the debt. Indeed, the Minister of Finance assures that this debt will be paid off within 10 years. Turning to the stock of Chinese foreign direct investment in Jamaica, let me preface that by saying it is difficult to track this down, particularly for private firms. But large firms, it's possible to track down their investment, but there are a number of small Chinese firms that have opened up, and it's not clear how much uh, has been invested, and it makes it difficult to arrive at an overall figure. But as of 2018, end of 2018, total Chinese foreign direct investment was approximately two billion US dollars. That may sound huge, but when it is compared to other indices, it is not that large. For example, the GDP of the country is US 14 billion in 2017. Total foreign direct inflows in 2017 was 800 million. The stock, total stock of foreign direct investment in Jamaica is 15.9 billion. So 2 billion is not a large or overwhelming share of this investment. But let us move from the aggregate figures now to look at the different types of firms and the investments they have made in Jamaica. Start, we differentiate three, state enterprises, large private firms, small private firms. State enterprises, there have been three notable investments. First of all, the Pan-Caribbean Sugar Company has invested in sugar factories they have leased land for cultivation. That's an important point to make because they don't own the land. The land hasn't been given over, it's leased. They have operated sugar factories, unfortunately, while they have invested some 260 million US dollars after a purchase worth approximately 10 million US that they have consistently lost money and are now looking to extricate themselves from that investment. So that has not been a success. There's also been investment by state enterprise in infrastructure. This was an involuntary investment in that the Chinese took over a highway which was unfinished, the famous highway to the north coast, which a French firm had been doing and they went bankrupt, couldn't complete it. The Chinese firm came in and made a large investment in this, a figure of about 600 million US dollars. And because of restrictions on the assumption of higher levels of debt, which were in the IMF agreement, the could, the government could not assume all the debt, and they decided to do two things. A, to allow the Chinese company to operate the road as a toll road, as a way of recovering some of their investment. But secondly, to offer them some land in, in exchange for some of the debt payment. Now that has been something which has been difficult to ascertain. There are a lot of rumors including that the government had given over laughing waters and other valuable things in Jamaica. I have no evidence of that. What I know is that the land that was to be given has not been settled, it has changed. It was originally supposed to be adjoining the highway for commercial and residential development. 
Then it shifted to land on which hotels would be built, and that remains unsettled as far as I've been able to ascertain. But it's not unusual. This has been done before and done by many countries, offering land in exchange, not just for the Chinese, but to settle debts. But that remains outstanding. The third investment is by China Harbor Construction, same firm that invested in the highway. They are, they are in a joint venture with Haitian and Jamaican companies and Mexican companies to manage the Norman Manley International Airport. Turning to large private firms, the major investment has been GIS, GISCO, a large iron and steel privately owned firm in China. In 2016, they bought the Alpat plant from Rosal of Russian Mining Company, and they have successfully restarted the operations and brought it up to speed. They invested $300 million in that plant, and uh, they are proposing to invest in a major special economic zone, and those estimates run to six billion US dollars and 60,000 jobs. That seems to be going well. Exports are up, and the operations are running, and it has stimulated economic activity around the plant. Turning now to small Chinese firms. This is very difficult to ascertain, but anecdotal evidence is that several small Chinese firms have opened up retail and wholesale businesses across the country. Remember that we have a long-standing resident Chinese Jamaican community that had a long tradition of being in the retail business, grocery stores, etc. The new set of um, non-resident Chinese have moved in. It's difficult to see um, how they came in. It's difficult to see uh, what they invested, but it is clear that there has been an increase in these businesses. I see nothing wrong with this, but there have been complaints that that has been at the expense of locally owned business. My position is that if they are operating legitimately, generating economic activity and paying tax, etc. I see nothing wrong with their operation, but it has also been an issue much talked about in Jamaica. Now I want to turn to the six allegations or issues which have been raised about Chinese operations. The first is the so-called loss of economic sovereignty. There are two ways in which some sovereignty could be lost. If the loans to the Chinese government became problematic, it has been suggested that this could provide some leverage on the government. But that, in all my research, with all the persons I've spoken to, there hasn't been any evidence of that. Foreign direct investment by Chinese. The sugar investment hasn't worked well. Part of the problem is that the company was new to foreign investment. It did not take local advice. It made mistakes, etc. And not only Chinese investors make mistakes, all investors make mistakes. Um, there is the bauxite plant. We have to note that the bauxite industry Bauxite and aluminum industry has traditionally been owned by Americans, Canadians, and Russians. Hence the Chinese, they're operating the plant successfully. Things are going well. It is an industry that local capital, both government sector and private, could not mount the resources to operate those businesses or to manage them. So I think that has been a gain the operation of that plant. The highway, I believe that that is going well. It is a remarkable feat of engineering, and uh, nobody can lift up the highway and take it away. So I haven't found 
a loss of economic sovereignty over this. However, remember something. Once you have a foreign investor and they own resources, they have control over the decision making. Those decision make, decisions may not always be in the national interest, but it is their prerogative of private owners, and that's allowed and legitimate. So once you have foreign investment, there is inevitably some loss of decision making over resource use and resource allocation. It comes with the turf. You accept foreign investment, you accept some loss. So I don't see this as a major loss of economic sovereignty. However, I must say in passing that much of the discussion about Chinese uh, having economic sovereignty it's not so much about what has happened, it's very much about what could happen. And people speculating of what could happen. Drawing on examples from other countries, in many cases not well documented, but speculating. I also invite you to remember that Jamaicans always had some discomfort with foreign ownership. <laughs> When the British owned the sugar industry through Tate and Lyle, there were complaints about foreigners owning all the land and so on. When the US and Canadian firms owned the bauxite industry, there were similar complaints. So there's always some <clears throat> concern about foreign direct investment. And it's not confined to Jamaica. Um, you will have instances where some countries that will remain nameless will restrict access to certain sectors on the basis of national security. That's their prerogative. So there's always a sensitivity about foreign direct investment, not peculiar to Jamaica. Um, secondly, the exercise of influence. I have been speaking to officials, former ministers, former prime ministers, trying to establish if to date China has sought to exercise influence because it has loaned Jamaica money. And I would cite a statement in the Daily Gleaner by former Prime Minister Jamaica of Jamaica, Bruce Golding. He says, there is nothing in China's outreach to be feared. I can say without reservation that in my dealings with Chinese officials, both here and in Beijing, while I was in office, I never had reason to doubt their sincerity or to think that we're seeking to exercise influence over Jamaica. I take that as a definitive factual statement. But again, the discussion is, OK, it hasn't happened yet, but it could happen. And I suppose if you're dealing with a global superpower, it can happen. But it hasn't happened yet, and therefore we should not, <clears throat> we should not condemn the relationship by speculating on what could happen. Thirdly, displacing Jamaican workers. This is a global complaint wherever there is Chinese investment. And some of this uh, arises from um, ethnicity and xenophobia, but it's a complaint. I think, though, that in recent years, Chinese enterprises have shown greater sensitivity because there has been considerable public pushback about jobs being displaced. I could spend the rest of the time here regaling you with citations of complaints in Africa, in Asia, in the rest of the Caribbean. No, but we need to look at what has happened. Let's take the Pan-Caribbean Sugar Company. They have 800 local staff and 26 um, Chinese staff. I visited the factory and I, for example, I noted in the computer room that there were five, there were six people, there were two Chinese nationals and there were four Jamaican engineers being trained. Gisco has approximately 730 Jamaicans and 151 Chinese. I assume like with the American and Canadian bauxite companies that over time Jamaicans will replace some of these but initially 
there are 151. China Harbor employs about 300 local staff and about 109 Chinese nationals. That to many people seems a bit excessive, but we can go to the work permits and look at the approvals. In 2016, 2017, there were 4,529 work permits approved. 83% was for professional and senior technical. Um, in the case of Chinese workers, there have been complaints that some unskilled workers are being listed as technicians, but the investigations which have been conducted in those cases have not yet turned up an actual case. There are also complaints that local workers on these construction sites have, are not getting fair treatment. There have been 298 investigations of these complaints and uh, there have not been any major cases. There have been need for some corrections. It is also said that some of the Chinese workers in Jamaica are actually convicts from China. I, I have not been able to ascertain any evidence on this. And uh, I know that it's a complaint which has been made elsewhere in the world. I also note that it's not a new complaint. There have been instances where countries have complained that inexpensive Chinese goods are competitive because they are made by slave labor. But I recall that in all countries, some sentences require labor. In some countries, they make license plates. And in some countries, as they used to in Jamaica, they made bricks. So I know that there are people who are doing hard labor in their imprisonment, but I haven't found any evidence anywhere to substantiate the use of convict labor overseas by Chinese firms, including in Jamaica. Let me turn now to unfair competition. Here, there is a case to answer. Chinese firms that come in often come in with incentives which allow them to import equipment, etc. At, few, at preferential rates. I think there is need to level the playing field in this regard because it does put small Jamaican firms at a disadvantage, but I think this is something that is fixable. However, we should note that there's a long tradition in Jamaica of giving incentives, including lower import duties, to foreign investors. Started long before the Chinese, it was very prevalent in the 60s, it's been restricted because of the IMF agreement, but it's offered to all foreigners. But I think there's a case to answer here to level the playing field for Jamaican firms and professionals so that they can compete. Remember something, it's difficult for a small firm in Jamaica with 50 people to compete against a huge global construction firm that has financing from a development bank like the China Development Bank. So size uh, is, a, is an issue here. It's not just that um, uh, there's discrimination or an, a, a playing field which is not level. Indeed, what has to be encouraged is for more uh, contracting out of work to Jamaican professionals. So there's a case to answer there. But I think that's something for us here in Jamaica through our government to address. The quality of work. It's often said that the work done by Chinese firms, and this building looks pretty secure to me, um, is said to be work that is not going to last and it's going to fall apart. Now, there are 
faulty construction projects everywhere in the world, including my local Jamaican contractors. So it's not outside of the possibility. I haven't found evidence in Jamaica, but there are cases that I would cite close by. There was a housing scheme in Trinidad which didn't work. There was a Chinese built sugar factory in Ghana that has not worked. Um, but in some cases, you have allegations, and when they're investigated, they're not found to be true. Uh, I cite the Arima Hospital in Trinidad, where work was stopped and investigation was conducted, and it, the allegations were found to be not supported. So I don't have any evidence would, that would suggest that the, the ratio of faulty construction to total construction is necessarily any higher for Chinese firms. And I would also say that in the building industry you have contracts which are enforceable and if work is not done properly then there are remedial measures. So I haven't found that evidence but it's quite prevalent. Lastly, insensitivity to the natural environment. China has a serious pollution problem, very serious. But it's not the only country with a serious pollution problem, but they do have a pollution problem. And it is said quite widely that they are insensitive to the natural environment. However, more recent studies have found that the Chinese have been able to compete successfully and to compete projects which meet international standards for um, adhering to sensitivity to the natural environment. I would suggest that we have to be careful about speculation and unfounded allegations. <clears throat> While we must take these seriously, there is a danger that we can lose projects because of the discussion about insensitivity to the environment. I recall that Goat Island, the discussion of it being pristine in nature was conflated with the fact that if the Chinese were to develop it, it would just devastate this unique natural environment. So we have to be careful that we don't scare off investment and discourage projects with unfounded allegations. Let me conclude by saying that looking at these six areas and doing a balanced scorecard, my conclusion is that the China-Jamaica capital connection has been a net positive economic benefit to Jamaica. It is not, however, without its problems, and these are problems which require government action. The extent to which a firm conforms with the laws of a country, the extent to which foreign direct investment is a net benefit to a country, the extent to which local firms are joint ventures in enterprises and the extent to which firms are conforming to sensitivity of the natural environment and the extent to which local firms and foreign firms including Chinese firms compete on a level playing field. These are issues for us here in Jamaica to deal with. These are issues for government policy. So my conclusion is the, the balanced scorecard shows that the Jamaica-China capital connection to date is a net positive economic contributor to Jamaica, but it is not without some problems. Thank you. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we have um, time for some questions, so I ask you to just direct them directly to Professor Bernard. First question. Denzel. Denzel. Thank you very much. Uh, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Bernard.
Thank you very much, PC Bruno. Uh, I find your, your conclusion quite interesting, though, uh, for uh, the, as you would appreciate, uh, the North South Link have the highest level of foreign direct investment that Jamaica has ever seen in its history in 2015. But interestingly, the economy only grew by 1.1%. And similarly, before that investment, the economy was growing by about 1.6, 1.7%. Uh, so the conclusion that we have a net benefit uh, is a little bit interesting. The question really, for you then is to say how you actually measure that net benefit in terms of capital connection. Yes, um, it is something which requires further work, but looking at it generally, the improvement in the infrastructure, the road, the efficiencies which it brings in transport, the mobility of tourists, etc. These are not things which necessarily show up in dollars and cents that you can calculate, but there are benefits which go into other things. You see with more tourists, more traffic, etc. So it requires further work. The other thing is that the impact of infrastructure and economic growth is an open discussion. At one stage, the Planning Institute was arguing that um, infrastructure development could be a leading sector, but many of the externalities go to other sectors and you see the benefit in tourism, in transport, etc. Professor Locke. Good afternoon, Mr. Ambassador, Mr. Prime Minister, former Prime Minister, and your good school. I'm from Sablama. I'm a retiree. I live in America for half a century. What I need to know from the government and from the university, are you going to take American money? In the past, in the centuries, there was this war by the left identifying those who owned the money and the capital. What we have noticed in Jamaica the past four years, since the Chinese are here. Silence. The media has not addressed the issue either. I'm from country, so I'm happy that the Chinese are here. I grew up with the Chinese in South America. But what is very disconcerting is the, the bigger income Jamaicans, like my mother, they no longer going to exist. Because Father Prime Minister was going to say, read article in the observer, somebody needs to say, yes, for the infrastructure, but no more Chinese entrepreneurs to take over the micro income local business. Anybody who wants to form a third party could turn over the cards next election. Because whenever you drive through Jamaica, Sablama, Granger, Lucy, anywhere, they hire any black Jamaican retail owner. Chinese have taken over that tomorrow. That, that's all the problem that I have with the Chinese. Now, Ambassador, I told you that I finished the conversation by saying there's a need for the government of Jamaica, and if Peter Wings to stop the Chinese. After they finish the major roads, they can go back home. Because the reason why they are here is because we cannot enter, the social said, we can entrust this huge amount of money to the Jamaicans who are in the construction business because they will not use the money to authorize what they are here for. But I have a concern the Jamaicans live in Africa. Nairobi, you know what's going on here with the Chinese. It doesn't happen in Jamaica. Nobody in Jamaica wants to speak up about the, 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 the dangers of the Chinese in Jamaica. And finally, what is so sad? You said here, and who's going said it two, two weeks ago, something may not be wrong, may not be breaking the law, but it is wrong. 
I'm very impressed by the former Prime Minister saying that, that sometimes people engage in actions. It's not a crime, but the action itself is wrong. What is happening in Jamaica with the Chinese? No diaspora and no Jamaica business person is getting an opportunity to compete with Chinese and the major infrastructure work. I know for a fact, I'm speaking from personal experience. For one entire year, my group of investors want to play a role in, in, in the reconstruction of the university. And from, from May until now, they have refused to meet with me like I'm carrying drugs, money. So that's a critical issue that we face. We need to address those prime ministers who go in holiness and Peter Phillips of the leader. And they said to us, we don't want no one else but the Chinese to come and develop Germany. Thank you so much. Thank you. Um, recall that I said in the construction industry, the ability of locals to compete and access to jobs, etc., that there's a case to answer, and that at the leveling of the playing field has to go on, and some proactive policies to insist on greater outsourcing of work, use of professionals. So there is a case to answer there, and that's something that the government can take up and do something about. The question of the the emergence or re-emergence of small Chinese businesses is a complex one and I think it's something that perhaps the university will have to study because you don't find data it's hard to know who owns it who financed it why did the local Jamaicans sell that business and move on we have to study all of that I freely admit that I don't have the answer to that I said I noticed that it has occurred on the basis of anecdotal evidence. Um, I am open to efficient businesses run by whoever. So I'm not objecting in principle because it's run by a foreign person. We have to understand why it has happened. So we need to study that. I don't have the answers to all of that. I signal it as something that is occurring and that it's a problem. I don't have the answers. Not this evening, anyway. Yes. Thank you very much, for Vice Chancellor. I mean, our cousins, the president of Jamaica China Friendship Association. Um, mine is not a question, but perhaps a comment on Professor Locke's statement. Uh, one, we need to decide whether we are or we are not a free economy. If we are a free economy, then I would think that anybody who has money and wants to go into business in Jamaica should not be excluded because he is Chinese or Canadian or American or Singaporean or Trinidadian for that matter. Uh, the second point I wish to make is that's exactly what was happening a um, hundred and something years ago when the ancestors of the current big business in, in Jamaica, now half Chinese and otherwise, um, came and set up small shops. It seems to be a strength in that country and their competition in a free economy, as far as I see, should not be considered as um, bad, because we can't decide that we, we don't want this one or that one because they are this or that. That is straightforward, Zinofood. Thirdly, I'd like to mention that when the big companies in the 50s 60s and 70s were investing in Jamaica. There was a much harsher regime. There was a time when a portion of Mandeville during the construction of our part was called Johannesburg, and I know that. There was a time when, during the construction of Uarton Works, 
that was almost the Johannesburg at Hayfield, and where the two senior, the only two senior Jamaicans who were on staff had to fight to their name that they were recruited in Canada to be allowed to live on senior staff side. So we have a history of this, and we do not have a history of this now. We moved on, and I think that we are at a stage where our own social order can cope with that sort of situation. Thank you very much. Um, let me just say that I think in Jamaica we are blessed with having a society in which a range of ethnic groups have coexisted peacefully. And my concern is that the kind of comments being made about Chinese from outside, I wouldn't like it to discourage foreign investment, period, because if you are of some different ethnic group, you might worry that if there is a pushback against Chinese ownership, maybe there will be a pushback against all foreign owners. We also have to be mindful that you have a Chinese Jamaican community. And we also don't want to, and they are in, the bus in business and investing. And we also want to be careful that we run an economy in which everybody has equal access. I'm not saying we must throw the door open to foreigners, but we have to be careful that when we talk about foreigners, we don't let that argument stray into areas which can make people uncomfortable. Uh, my name is Mark Shilesho. I remember way back when, when I was a mostly more than a teenager, um, graduating from UTEC. And at that time, if there was a project going on, as soon as I was at ADC, I was rural, um, there was a requirement that a reasonable amount of Jamaican engineers were employed. Basically, student engineers, which is what I was interested in, but also regular Jamaican engineers. So the engineering companies themselves were able to build up their own assets and build up their own expertise. Is this happening with the, with the Canadian companies? Because I don't see with the Chinese companies. Because I don't see the Jamaican company involvement, particularly the engineering and construction company involvement, that I would like to see. I see far too much of a foreign investment um, and foreign uh, engineers coming in and foreign uh, people taking over. And without the development of our own engineering practices, our own engineering expertise, particularly, in, of course, mechanical construction and electrical. The second question, maybe if we want to use that first, I have another question. Go ahead. The second question is, it is a rumor that I hope is wrong, but on the Northwest Highway, that a lot of it, the property was used to pay for the road construction. So therefore, we are um, giving away, you might say, a lot of our assets in land, which has a very high future value to a foreigner that have absolutely no interest in, in developing that land. And we will then end up with passageways of dead land on both sides, or we will land the used land on both sides. I hope that is not correct, but maybe you could confirm it being correct or not correct. Thank you. As I said earlier, I don't think that which land it is has been settled, but I am sure that a part of the part of the deal for any land must be a condition of it, the what is going to be developed on it, and that it can't just be handed over without development. These are things where the government needs to look out more carefully for the kind of regulations and the kind of negotiations they do with all foreign investors, not just Chinese foreign investors, but all foreign investors to maximize the benefits for the country and to protect the interests of the country. It's not a criticism of the present government. It's a systemic issue.
in the news. Again, that's an issue if the government insists that foreign firms have to use a certain amount of local expertise. Right now, the country is short of local engineers. Some professor, or maybe some information also I'd like to share with uh, the audience here. That a good example is that uh, just recently, GISCO, uh, actually that was uh, launched last year, early, early last year, last month, March, March, March last year, that uh, they in, invited uh, some 52 uh, graduates from UTEC and uh, UWI, I believe, also to China for training programs to be to be, to be further trained as uh, as more skilled skillful uh, engineers. Uh, they already they came back. Every one of them were fully employed. That's and also I heard that the Chinese company not only Gisco but also. Uh, China Harbor is doing that too. Yes, I think this makes eminent good sense in that it makes for a much better relationship with locals. The firm that employs local expertise gains knowledge of the country which they can't gain in a short amount. This is what happened when the Canadians and Americans first got into the bauxite mining and aluminum processing. They trained Jamaicans and eventually Jamaicans ran the industry, it happened in the tourist industry. So I'm happy to see that um, Cisco and China Harbor is doing more of this. An issue? Yes. An issue that has not been discussed, but I think needs to be discussed, is whether there is anything that we can learn from the Chinese and whether there is anything that we would want to learn from the Chinese. Wilma Perkins used to recite what a call of Tobago Budan's program said. One Chinese can do five smarty work. I had, a, I had a personal experience. I toured the construction site of Secrets Hotel when it was being built. It was built by Chinese contractors. And when I got there, there was a large crowd at the gate at the entrance. Very boisterous. Complained to me that there are Chinese workers over there pushing wheelbarrows and sweeping up the yard. I called for an insurance with Minister of Labor because I know we had limited the number of work permits that would be issued for that project. I said, Fernand, how many work permits did we issue? He said, hold on, let me check. He said, we had agreed on 22, and so far I issued 19. I said, well, something is wrong because, and these were, these work permits were, were for highly skilled yeah. people, master craftsmen. I said, something is wrong because they have Chinese workers here doing manual labor. He sent an officer down there the following day to investigate it. And what was the report? The master carpenter would climb the ladder, put up his formwork, if his hammer fell out of his belt, he would descend the ladder, pick up the hammer, and go back to do his work. And when he was through, he came down, grabbed a push broom, cleaned up the mess, put it in a wheelbarrow, and pushed that away. If you employed a grade one Jamaican carpenter, he not doing that. <laughs> Firstly, he had to have a second. The job of the second is to spear the ground so that if the hammer fell from the bell, he can pick it up and pass it to him. And don't ask the Jamaican grade one carpenter to sweep up no rubbish and push the wheelbarrow. It's, that's not his job. That's not what he learned his skill for. So I would love for us to get into a discussion. Are there things about Chinese work, culture, and ethics that we don't want? because this is going to put us back to some period long ago from which we have emancipated ourselves? Or are there things that we can draw from them to improve our efficiency? One of the reasons why local contractors are not able to compete. You made the point, they're too small. 
And for the life of me, they will never get together, two, three of them, and form a joint venture to know we are going to join together to, to bid on this project. I'll give you another example. The engineers and architects troubled for years to get professional registration legislation because they used to complain about foreign architects and engineers coming in and so on. We did that in the 80s. We set up a registration board. They run it. They're the ones who sit on the board. The registrar is named by, by them. And I kept getting complaints later on that you still had foreign architects who were doing drawings here. I said, but it's against the law. They can be arrested for that. What was happening? Local architects would be approached by a foreign architect to say, no, I have a job with this for this particular project, but I can't work in Jamaica without registration. Come in on this thing with me. And the local architect will simply take his stamp, stamp the plans for a fee, and he's quite happy. He gets a fee, the foreign architect is working. We Jamaicans have a problem and we need to start looking into ourselves to find out what is it that we are doing to ourselves that is preventing us from, from advancing as much as we should. I, I said three quick things. There's an article in, on the front page of the Greener which complained that um, foreign technicians were taking Jamaican jobs. This had nothing to do with the Chinese. So I'm saying there's a general view that foreigners are taking Jamaican jobs. Secondly, I cite an article where somebody who complained about the Chinese was rebutted by somebody who said, if you are looking at who is working on a Sunday, you won't find the Jamaicans, but you will find the Chinese. And thirdly, there was an instance in which there were two crews, one Chinese, one Jamaican, doing the same task. The Chinese finished in time and started to do some of the Jamaicans' workers. The issue is not the productivity of the Jamaicans. It is that they want the work to last as long as possible, whereas the incentive of the Chinese was to finish as soon as possible. And lastly, I was recently told that there are some aspects of work which Jamaican workers didn't want to do. I don't remember what aspect it is, and that only Chinese workers would do that part of the work. The last thing I would say is, there is a benefit when you're dealing with a big global company. One of the problems which caused the French firm to give up the highway was the embankments, how to cut and retain those embankments through these large hillsides. And how that was solved is the Chinese asked for a one week work permit for their global specialists on embankments. They brought him here for a week and he was able to solve the engineering problems, but he's a global specialist for them. Sometimes the expertise you need is not readily available locally. But the key point is, Local companies are small and they will not get together to form larger entities which can bid on these products. And lastly, the Norman Manley Airport was built by a Canadian firm. And my son, who is an architect, was the local counterpart. So there is room for joint work. So, one more question, Professor. Thank you very much, Professor Bernal. Thank you for your lecture. This has been a very interesting discussion in the aftermath of your lecture. I just want to say two things. Let me start with the issue of work ethic and so on. I think it's unfair to ignore the fact of history. When you have an imported labor force, when you have contracted laborers, it is a different scenario from the attitudes, expectations of a local population. The local laborers, they live here. They have their families, they have a culture. So it is not fair to say they won't work on a Sunday um, because you're gonna have other social fallouts if they do. What we need is a level playing field. We need labor codes and regulations 
so that the Jamaican worker is not being so unfairly compared to an imported contracted labor force. That's the first thing. Second thing I want to say is that Jamaica should not only be about dollars and cents. It cannot be a country in which we are ignoring our history, ignoring the fact that our people, freed from enslavement, mostly through their own efforts, have been struggling since 1838 to try to find a way to have economic empowerment and so on. But the state has a responsibility to help to protect those Jamaicans who are not able to have the finances to put together to be competitive. We have to decide what kind of Jamaica we want. If we don't find a way to have everyone living and being able to live in a respectable way, then we're always going to find someone as the bogey. And we don't want to be accused of xenophobia. We don't want to be accused of that. But we have to find a way to ensure that Jamaican people feel that they have a stake in this land and that they are not being every day being called upon to operate in an unfair environment. I'll just leave it there. Two comments. One is the experience has always been that if Jamaican workers are paid, whether locally or when they are abroad, well, they work on Sunday. And I know when the garment manufacturing firms were here, <clears throat> that the jockey and Haynes plants were among their most efficient in the world. So in the right conditions, Jamaican workers are excellent and productive. I want to close with a pet peeve. I want to agree with you that it's not all Donald's dollars and cents. And I want to end by saying the National Parliament building of Jamaica must be designed and built by Jamaicans. Okay, um, we thank uh, Ambassador Burnham for his uh, presentation and his responses. So, will you join with me and give him another round of applause? Before we conclude this program, I'm going to call upon Ambassador Sue Cobb, who will make a presentation to uh, Ambassador Burrow. Over to you. Thank you. Let's just do this. <laughs> thank you very much. Uh, thank you all for coming, ambassadors, prime ministers, distinguished people all, and particularly my friends <laughs> who I uh, was able to see tonight. Uh, it was a real honor for me to have uh, Richard Bernal agree to give the Cobb Lecture. Certainly an issue of great importance to Jamaica's future. He has been a longtime friend. He came to my swearing-in ceremony as United States Ambassador to Jamaica in 2001. And he has given me good advice along the way, and I'm very, very happy that he could speak tonight on such an important subject. So we, we have the usual token gifts to present. Uh, yeah. Okay, and as we bring this um, program to its conclusion, I'm going to call on uh, Ms. Wendy Hart, who is the President of American Friends of Jamaica, to give the closing remarks. Thank you. Um, protocols have been observed, but I'm very happy to be here today with such um, a wonderful crowd of ambassadors, Prime Minister. Um, welcome, ladies and gentlemen, welcome all. It's my job tonight to thank um, many people here. First of all, Ambassador Bernal, 
one of the first things he said when I came in was, I think uh, people will be expecting controversy and I won't be very controversial tonight. <laughs> well, I think, uh, I, I think there's a bit in there, there was a little bit of controversy certainly in, in how it's taken, but I think it's informed and, and uh, the speech causes us to take time to reflect on um, assumptions and think about what really underlies those assumptions, so thank you um, for that. Um, I know I'm always very happy when I'm here at the lecture series. Um, it's been way too long since I was regularly attending in a center of academic excellence. And so I really look forward to this every year. Um, I always come away having learned a lot. Um, I would like to thank the team at University of West Indies who help us um, to support us and put this on every year and particularly to Dr. Lisa Lindo, who it's amazing with everything that she has to do, um, that she focuses on maintaining and building the relationship between UE and the AFJ. I'd also like to thank the team at the um, US Embassy, um, Sharj Kant, and to Mr. Paul Sully and the rest of the team who always support us in the work that we do in Jamaica. Um, I also just want to highlight a little bit about our partnership. Ambassador Cobb, um, in her time here and since then as president of American Friends of Jamaica and President Emer Emeritus of uh, American Friends of Jamaica has really led the way in um, you know, highlighting the importance of us supporting this Center of Excellence for Jamaica. Our work is uh, much broader than the Cobb Lecture Series. Um, we also support multiple scholarships to students of academic excellence, including Cobb scholarships. Um, we have uh, supported grants to the Center of Early Childhood Education, which is a particular focus of our work, as well as to Dudley Grant and to Insights for Parenting Workshops, for Teacher Workshops, to build the quality of education throughout the country and to support the work of the university. So I would like to thank you all for joining us this evening. And uh, we look forward to yet to, to wait, yes, and we'll have a reception following, which I'm sure we're all ready to go to now. And I hope you'll join us and we look forward to you being back with us next year. Thank you. Okay, thank you all for coming and have a good evening.